Paul had been kicked out of so many cities at this point. The pattern was really clear. He shows up, shares the gospel in the synagogue with the people who were supposed to be waiting for the Christ. God would open some hearts and others would reject him. And eventually they would turn on Paul. Sometimes there would be a riot, sometimes he'd be beaten, sometimes he'd be jailed. And he'd have to move on to another city. And it happened in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Athens. If you've been here for this series, hopefully those names at least sound a little familiar at this point. Even if you can't say, well, this happened in that city. I don't know. I think I would have been really frustrated and depressed if that had kept on happening to me. And yet in every city, God did open some hearts. In every city, there were some that rejoiced that Jesus came for sinners like them. In every city, some were baptized. Now Paul went on. He knew the pattern. And he came to the coastal city of Corinth. Now, these days, if you happen to get fine Corinthian leather, you know that's supposed to be really cut, good leather. Maybe some of you remember the ads from, I think it was back in the 80s, that was a big thing, Corinthian leather. But back then, if you were Corinthian, that was a bad thing. Corinthian, to be a Corinthian meant to hand yourself over to your lusts. And whatever it was you wanted, that ran your life. If you wanted anything, particularly sexually, you could find it in Corinth. Anything. Paul came to that city. And as a rabbi, he was invited to speak in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And as he sat down to teach, he looked over the assembled congregation. He wondered, who is God going to open the hearts of? Who is going to reject him? Who would be the one throwing the first rock if he was going to be stoned here? Paul opened up the scriptures and read and explained, Brothers and sisters, you know that we are sinful that all the blood of beasts that has been shed has not been enough to take away our sin. But God promised that the Christ, who would be stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and by his wounds he, we would be healed. God has sent this Christ, a man named Jesus, who was crucified, and three days later he rose from the dead, and now in his name, repentance and forgiveness of sins is preached across the whole world. After worship, a man wanted to talk to Paul. Paul, my name is Aquila. This is my wife, Priscilla. We're tent makers. Uh, we've been kicked out of Rome. The emperor said that there couldn't be any more Jews in Rome, and we've come to live here and work our trade. We've heard of you, Paul, and we worship this Jesus already. We are thrilled that you're here. Won't you come and work with us? Uh, be a tent maker with us. That'll give you a reason to be in the city and we'll give you the monetary support you need to, you know, be able to eat. And Paul took them up on the offer. And all day, Paul would work making tents with Priscilla and Aquila and he got to talk about Jesus with them, strengthen their faith. And on the Sabbaths, he went and reasoned in the synagogue. That second Sabbath, another man approached. Rabbi, my name is Titius Justice. I'm, I'm not Jewish, but I am amazed that this Jesus would come for Gentiles like me too. I live right next door. If you would like to use my home to teach, come and use my home. The next Sabbath, the synagogue president, the guy in charge of making sure the synagogue kept running, he and his entire family were baptized. Soon enough, Paul's missionary team, Titus and Silas, I'm sorry, Timothy and Silas, finally caught up to him. And from then on, Paul just threw himself into preaching. And every week, more and more people came to believe, and every week, those who rejected grew more and more stony-faced. Paul knew the pattern. He was waiting. And then it happened. We don't know exactly what happened. The Bible just says that the Jews turned abusive to Paul. But at that point, Paul shook out his robes. 
kind of a weird phrase. It's a picture that if a crumb landed on me from your synagogue, I don't even want the crumb to stick with me. Shake up my robe so nothing stays with me. Fine. Your blood be on your own heads. You don't want Jesus. You don't count yourself worthy of eternal life. Fine. From now on, I'm going to just the Gentiles. And that night, Paul made a vow. The Old Testament outlines that there was a certain vow that you could take to, to show and dedicate your life to just following God and doing nothing else but doing that for a period of time. You could do it for a week, for a year, however long you wanted. But as long as you were in that vow, you had to have an outside sign of that vow. You couldn't drink alcohol, you couldn't t- touch a dead body, and you couldn't cut your hair. And every week from then on, as Paul went to the next door house, there's the synagogue and there was the house of Titius Justice, and that's where he went to lead worship. Every week the Jews saw him with his hair growing longer. It was a testimony, I'm still Jewish and I follow this Jesus. But Paul knew the signs. In Thessalonica, it had been three weeks before he'd been kicked out. In Philippi, a couple months maybe. How long was he going to be able to be here? That night, Jesus appeared to him in a dream. And Jesus said to Paul, Do not be afraid. Keep on preaching. Do not be silent, for I am with you. To hear the voice of his master. To see him again. Paul wept at those words. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. And Jesus kept his word. For 18 months, for a year and a half, Paul got to preach. Paul got to share Jesus with so many people. And every week, the Jews started hating him more and more and more and more. Until the end of 18 months, they decided enough was enough, and they seized him, and they dragged him to the Bema, to the judgment seat. And they threw him in front of the proconsul, and they accused him, this man is advocating that we should worship God in ways that are illegal. And the judge did not care. Anti-Semitism was a real huge thing back then. You heard that the emperor before had kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Well, his officials had picked up on that. You Jews are coming in and giving an accusation. I don't care. Get out. And the anti-Semitism got even worse because as the Jewish accusers were leaving the court, the crowd attacked them and beat them on the steps of the courthouse. And the judge didn't care. But the judge's decision actually meant something interesting. That because the judge didn't care about what Paul was saying, Paul was legal. He could keep on preaching as long as he wanted. And so he stayed there. And he kept on sharing Jesus. And he kept on sharing Jesus at the end of two, maybe even three years. He said, it's time to move on. God has kept his promise. I made a vow. It's time to keep my promise. And so he left Corinth with many tears and a lot of embraces. And he cut off his hair. That's the sign of the end of the vow. But God had outlined at the end of the vow, you cut off your hair, then you go to Jerusalem and you burn the hair as a saying, I have dedicated this to God and it goes to God and that's where it stays. So Paul boarded a ship to go back to Jerusalem. And it's interesting to note that uh, it doesn't say that Silas and Timothy went with him. They might have stayed behind. Corinth kept at least two of their pastors. But different people went with Paul. The tent makers, Priscilla and Aquila, they went with Paul. By sharing Jesus, now more people were going to share Jesus. The ship wasn't sailing straight for Israel. It stopped in Ephesus, another port city. It was going to be there for a few days, so Paul went up to the synagogue, and as a traveling rabbi, he was invited to come and preach, and he sat down and he shared, brothers and sisters, you know the scriptures. They say we're sinful, so much that all the blood of beasts would not be enough. 
but God has promised to send the Christ, that he would be stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and by his wounds we would be healed. God has kept his promise, and he has sent the Christ. He's a man named Jesus, who was crucified and three days later rose from the dead. And now in his name, repentance and forgiveness of sins is preached across the whole world. And God opened hearts. And the synagogue begged Paul, Paul, stay. We want to know more. But Paul had made a promise. He made a vow. He had to go back to Jerusalem. So he said, if God wills it, I'm coming back. And on the way back to the ship, Priscilla and Aquila are walking with Paul, and they say, Paul, you need to go to Jerusalem, but we don't. We're going to stay here. And they started the church in Ephesus. And Paul sailed the ship back to Caesarea, a port city, went up to Jerusalem, burned his hair, as he had promised, and he got to talk to the other apostles. He got to talk to Peter, and the church rejoiced in what Paul had done in sharing Jesus across the world. And then Paul went north to Antioch, back to home. He wasn't going to stay there long, though. The uh, third missionary journey started in less than a year after that. But that's a history for another time. For now, three things. The gospel goes with you. Jesus is not just for this building. The gospel goes with you. Just as Paul took the gospel wherever he went, it goes with you. Jesus is with you at school. He is with you at work. He is with you. And that may sound really scary because it means that he's watching what you're doing, but it also means that he is there in his forgiveness and his mercy. He is with it, or, and he, he is not going to say on the last day, oh, I didn't know about that sin. Sorry, I didn't die for that one. All of them. The gospel goes with you. Two, because the gospel goes with you, you get to share the gospel wherever you go. Paul shared the gospel in Corinth, where he was for years, and he shared in Ephesus, where he was for a couple of days. You get to share the gospel at work, at school, with friends, online or overseas. God gives you the ability to share Jesus with others. And three, that may sound really scary, but it's not. You already share the things you're into. This morning I was talking about board games. I like board games. It was not hard for me to talk about board games. Some of you have heard me talking about Star Trek, and you roll your eyes. It's not hard for me to talk about Star Trek. Yes, I'm a geek. I get it. Y'all, you talk about the things you're into. You talk about golf, and it's not hard for you. You talk about the Bengals. Season opener next week, right? Is that preseason yet? Um, next week. You talk about that. It's not hard. Think about this. This is Jesus who died for you. If it's hard for you to share, okay, I get it. Go back and get into Jesus more. The answer isn't to beat yourself up or to feel guilty. It is hard for me to talk about the Bengals because, honestly, I'm just not that much into them. I don't care as much. But I care about board games, so I talk about them. Well, if I'm going to share Jesus, it means I'm going to get more into him. What has he done for me? And then go back to point one. The gospel goes with you. You are forgiven. For the times that you shut your mouth, you're forgiven. For the times that you refused, you're forgiven. For the times that you shared, but you were really bad at it, Jesus still loves you. <laughs> Go back. The gospel goes with you. Amen. Let's stand.